Hi and welcome to five free ways to create awesome employee retention and motivation levels in your small business. My name is Mike Jones. I'm one of the co-founders of Better Happy and in this session today I'm going to take you through some great tips and some good insights into how you can increase those really important retention and motivation levels in your small business without spending a penny. So who's this workshop designed for? Well, it's really designed for the business owner that's turned into a team leader, maybe without choosing to do so. So you started the business by being good at what you do. You weren't, uh, you didn't have capital investment, you were self-funded and you've developed a team around you. And now you don't just have to be good at business. You've also got to figure out how to keep a team of people happy, motivated, engaged and wanting to stick around. It might also be of interest to HR professionals that are interested in how to get the most out of people and how to actually look after people and also team members you might find it of interest as well but like i said predominantly it's aimed at the business owner as will become apparent throughout the workshop what we're going to touch on in today's workshop then is a little bit of psychology so don't get stressed i'm not going to be dialing down into any complex reports but we have to have a little bit of a basic understanding of what makes humans tick so that we can uh, create the best relationship with them we're going to talk a fair bit about shifting mindset because a lot of the challenges with employee engagement and retention in a small business are actually within the owner's head. We're going to help you focus on working less and achieving more, which is always a win. And throughout the workshop, we're going to give you lots of free tips and tools that you can pinch and use right away. So most of us, when we've got a team, we're at this stage in business. It's one of the final hurdles we've got to get past being good at nurturing this team in order to get to the, the ideal that we started out with a vision of, you know, the business that works for us, that makes a difference in the world, that's a positive. But what happens for a lot of business owners is we get to this point and we want to go backwards, back over here to the left. And why is that? Because we think about it, we get a bit stressed, we have a few team members annoy us or maybe leave and we just think to ourselves, you know what, it was easier when it was small. I didn't have to manage other people. It was a lot simpler and I could just do it all myself. You know, So those are the appeals of going backwards. However, if we're really honest about it, we also know that if we do that, we're going to have limited impact in our business. If it's just you and you haven't got a team around you, there's only so much you can do. The work-life balance is actually going to go because it's only you again. You're going to be stuck in the business. The business only works when you're working and opportunities will come about that you know would have been great for your business, but because you haven't got a team, you just haven't got the capacity to take them. So we don't want that, okay? So we need to keep chugging away. Uh, and although this bit's hard, getting through this barrier and figuring out how to get the most out of people, uh, it's got its challenges, you know? We need to change our approach. We need to embrace mistakes because it's not, it's definitely not gonna be a perfect process. And we're probably gonna need to lower our standards, which is something we talk about today as well. However, we're gonna have a wider impact. We're gonna get to do what we enjoy in the business versus doing everything. We're gonna have that great work-life balance some freedom from the business, and we're gonna be able to seize those new opportunities when they come about. So the argument for is is very strong. So it's an important thing to, uh, to get into our heads. Uh, a very brief piece on me then. So my name's Mike, as I already mentioned, I'm the co-founder of Better Happy. Uh, my professional career started in the army, army intelligence analyst and uh, physical training instructor. Did a lot of leadership stuff in the army. And after five years and two tours of Afghanistan supporting special forces, I decided I was unhappy and I wanted to leave. So I stuck on a backpack, traveled the world, lived on monasteries, taught kids English, studied different cultures, lived amongst different cultures and, and learned a lot about human psychology and realized that people that have less than us very often are actually happier than us, which is a real eye opener for me. So uh, after that period of time of traveling for three years, I decided that I wanted to come back to the UK and help other people. So I started my first small business, uh, a CrossFit gym, I grew my own little team as you can see down here and I made every mistake in the book which is why I understand so many of the issues that I'm going to talk about today because I've, I've made them all myself and suffered from them and at the same time as uh, as Metabox was being grown I um, had the opportunity to start doing well-being services with businesses and from that evolved better happy since 2018 so since then since 2018 we've worked with hundreds of business owners and their staff uh, ac across a different range of industries so we really get to see and understand the challenges that people face and how to address them we really exist but happy to address this curve so uh, this curve is a correlate for um, engagement levels and well-being levels so if it's low it essentially implies that people aren't enjoying their work and if it's high it implies that they are enjoying their work and they're healthy 
The ugly truth is, is that for most business owners and their staff, work comes as a negative on their well-being and they don't enjoy the work. Uh, so this is a problem. So globally, Gallup have found that 15% of employees are engaged. There's some data to suggest this might be going up slightly, but it's still very, very low. So that means that 85% of employees around the world go to work just to do their job. They don't actually enjoy it, which is bad. And I think this is a conservative estimate um, from some studies, but 55% of owners say that owning a business has a negative impact on their personal life. And I can resonate with that. I've been there. You start off, you think it's going to be great. Uh, and then obviously the challenges come and it's not too long until the same. Wasn't it just easier to have a job? The answer is no. This is a slide. This is a visual we're going to return to today, uh, at regular points. But this essentially shows the the small business owner journey. And we're talking about a self-funded small business owner, not a uh, business that's had capital investment. So a small business owner starts on their own, their partner supports them, they're very motivated, very engaged, they're excited about what they're going to achieve. They then uh, achieve a level of success, typically, typically within six months to two years. And they develop a little team because they can no longer do all the work themselves. Uh, and they're still motivated. They're there, they're involved in everything, it's still going. And then any point up to kind of one to five years in, the, boat, the business owner starts to struggle. Uh, and so does the team. The business owner gets burnt out. They simply can't be involved in everything anymore. They haven't got the energy left. The team's bigger. It's harder to manage the team. The team don't seem to be as engaged. Uh, so this is the challenge phase. But just as that image before showed, you know, the light at the end of the tunnel is that satisfaction stage where you've got a team that runs a business for you. Um, and you can enjoy good work-life balance. It just takes a bit of mental discipline and some guidance to shift from that struggle zone into that satisfaction zone and not try and run back to startup zone or success zone because actually it, it won't feel the same once we get back there. We developed the five S's, uh, the Better Happy Five Skills, to address this, but we'll talk about that towards the end of this training. So what do we need to know? I said we're going to touch on a little bit of psychology. This is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. If you haven't heard about it, it's a widely accepted psychological model that implies that humans naturally need to fulfill their needs and will progress once need, once one need is fulfilled. So at the bottom, people need food and water. If they haven't got food and water, nothing else matters. Humans will do all they can to get that. After they've got food and water, they'll start to uh, search for shelter and safety. And as we work at the map there, we can see at the pyramid there what the next stages are. What's important for you to understand as a business owner is that high performance really happens at the top here. Okay, so that's esteem from others. So once somebody starts to feel like they're good at what they do, next level self-esteem, so they feel confident in themselves. And then finally, self-actualization, which is being connected to values and meaning. Most businesses... If we're just paying people, this is all we're doing really. We're, we're providing them with these bottom two. Uh, a lot of small businesses are quite good at this. So paying them and making them feel like they belong at a part of a community. But typically small businesses due to lack of um, awareness and lack of structure are pretty poor at addressing those top levels. Now I say small businesses, but you'll probably be surprised at how many large businesses and huge corporations struggle with this as well. And we'll talk about why actually later on in the workshop. So if we can get really good at this top piece here, and guiding people through here, we're going to create high levels of performance and high levels of loyalty within our businesses. So let's look into why or how, excuse me. So number one, we've got create and communicate your business vision and mission. What on earth does that have to do with employee retention and engagement? If we look over here on the left, this is a kind of strategy flow chart and at the bottom of the strategy flow chart is a job so the job flows out of these different components now if we haven't got a vision and mission which sits at the top of that nothing else can flow out from it so we end up just having a job and the person doing that job doesn't really feel that their job is meaning that it's, that it's meaningful that it's got value that it's tied into the bigger picture so they're just having these bottom three parts of maslow's fulfilled by that maybe they feel a sense of belonging in the business as well so they're doing work they're getting paid, they feel like they, you know, they belong to the business, they're part of the team, but actually they don't really know how the day-to-day -day of what they're doing is connected to the bigger picture. And, and if this stays this way, as we've already highlighted, people will start to crave that next level of those next levels of the pyramid. So if they're not getting it from work, they're going to go and search for it elsewhere. So when we get our vision and our mission, mission, which is our ultimate objective in the business, once we get that clarified and communicated and articulated and written down, 
then we can start to create meaningful objectives, quarterly objectives, and we can create like powerful job description and KPIs in line with the vision and the mission. And then we can start to guide people through this process of showing them that they're doing a good job, helping them feel more empowered, and then really ultimately connecting them to the bigger picture. But it has to have that vision and that mission. There's lots of studies coming out now showing you that you know, there's LinkedIn one at the top here. Nine out of 10 millennials actually would consider taking a pay cut to go to a different company that's vision and values are more aligned to theirs. So if nine out of 10 people would consider taking a pay cut to go to a different company because of its vision, how's that statistic impacting your business if we haven't written down a vision and mission and we haven't even communicated it? And the honest answer is most small businesses don't have a vision and mission statement written down. Why is this? Well, the truth is they do have a vision and mission, but it's all stuck in the owner's head. And if you're anything like me, you'll be sat there nodding your head now because you know this is true. Okay, but the reason they don't write it down is the owner's too modest. They think it's only for big corporates, that stuff. It's not gonna make any difference if I write down the, the, the little things that I wanna achieve with my accountancy or my service-based business, whatever it might be. You know, you think you, you, you downplay it in your head. And the second is that the owner gets stuck in the process of writing a vision and a mission. They think it's this big corporate thing that only corporates do. They go on the internet, look at Google. There's 50,000 different ways to do it. They all conflict each other uh, and we don't even know where to get started. So that, bearing in mind how important this is, let's break that down. So we're just going to spend a few minutes now and, to, and I want to show you that actually having a vision and a mission statement isn't that complicated. And if we just break it down to its constituent parts, it's quite a straightforward process. So your vision consists of two key components. Who you exist to help, okay? Is it is it people? Is it the planet? Or less less airily, is it just profits? You know, you could say that as well. If you if you if your business is there just to make money, then don't beat around the bush, say that. So Amazon here is customers, but ultimately Amazon do exist to make money. That's really the only reason that the main reason they exist. Uh, IKEA. Uh, to the, to better the many people. Tesla are actually, you know, people think Tesla exists to make great electric cars, but actually if you look at their vision, that's not why they exist. They exist to accelerate the world's transition to sustainable energy. Better Happy, we're quite lofty here, so we're saying we want to help the world, but we could break that down the level and say we want to help businesses and their people. And then the second component of our vision is simply the change we, we exist to make. So if you can click your fingers and fast forward 10 years into the future and your business has achieved everything you want it to achieve, what change is made in the world because of your business? So Amazon are the, the, the Earth's most customer-centric company. IKEA have made better everyday lives and this starts to make sense to us. If we know IKEA, we start to understand the why in their furniture now. Tesla, the world's transition to sustainable energy. Uh, better happy, we've got the, the world's a better place through happy businesses and people. Now, that's really all you've got to do write down those two things and you can do this on your own you can spend an hour on it with your business partner you can get your team involved and just really really drill out these two parts uh, but you can then stress test it with this tool from better happy just go over to our website and click free downloads at the top the toolkit and download the vision tool uh, and this stress tests it on the left there so is it a maximum of 30 words okay we don't want it to be too wordy is it talking about an outcome, not an action? Because you'll start naturally writing your mission statement instead of your vision statement. So that tool's over there. Um, head over there and pinch that. And then you've got to do your mission as well. And your mission essentially consists of the unique way in which you want to do things. And this is really important. So think about a good question for this is what do we do better than our competitors? Why do people come to us? Now, you might do one thing the same as them, two things the same as them. It's unlikely you do three things the same. So you write down your one to three unique things. So a few examples here. Amazon, really, they're about selection, price, and convenience. And if you think about Amazon, um, what makes them as good as they are, is because they've got a huge selection they're cheap and they're as quick as can possibly be you know if we say why do people use amazon instead of ebay well ebay's cheap ebay's got a huge selection but amazon's quicker yeah you can get stuff done on one on one click you can have it delivered the next day so that's what's given them that edge over ebay um ikea well designed function functional home furnishings at prices so low that as many people as possible can afford them and i think that rings true with ikea their stuff's well designed, it's functional, yeah, it does the job, and it's relatively affordable compared to many other furniture companies. At Better Happy, we focus on the business, the owner, and the employees. We don't know many companies that focus on all three. So it starts to help you understand how you go about stuff and your employees. 
Again, you can stress test this. Uh, I didn't mention Tesla there, but again, they're making electrical vehicles. They wanna make the best car company and electric vehicles, but remember they're doing that because they wanna facilitate the world's transition to sustainable energy. So you've got a stress test there again. So this is all more about the action. And when we stick both of these together, you can go and pinch this from Better Happy. When you stick both of these together, you get your ultimate objective. So IKEA's ultimate objective is to create a better everyday life for the many people, their vision, by offering a wide range of well-designed functional home furnishing products at prices so low as many people as possible can afford them. That's their ultimate objective. So you start to understand the why for the company and every job within IKEA will be, every person that has a job within IKEA will be connected to that. They'll know why what they do is connected to that big picture. And it cascades down. So they'll be able to look at that as a leadership team every year and then go, okay, well, what do we want to achieve this year to be better at making the world uh, better, making a better everyday life for the many people by doing these things. So we'll have a yearly objectives that fall from that, which is then quarterly objectives. What does our company need to look like to achieve that? Okay, what do people on the ground need to be doing? So it all comes together from the vision and the mission. And if that's stuck in your head and not written down and not communicated to your employees and your customers, you're missing a trick. Okay, so don't downplay it. Make sure you get it done. Do it as a workshop with your team if you don't want to do it on yourself. Use those little cheat cards that I've just showed you, but just get the basics done. Okay, next then, implement basic systems and structure. Again, if we look at this chart, startup and success phase of the business, we probably had minimal to no systems or processes. And, in, and let's be honest, if we'd have tried to put too many rigorous systems and processes in place at the beginning, we probably wouldn't have got anywhere because we were figuring it out as we we're going along. We we're adapting to the market, we we're adapting to our clients, adapting to technological changes. However, now you're at a stage in business where your team's got bigger and the batteries on you, the owner, have started to get run down a bit. So you can no longer rely on just you being there going, right, do this, do that, do that. It doesn't work anymore. It's bad for the team and it's bad for you. So at this stage in business, for us to progress, we need to start implementing systems and structure. We need to shift from being a doer to being a builder. And that's what helps us as individuals, as the business owners, actually reach our, our, our self-actualization, our vision. If you're really honest with yourself, your vision probably didn't involve you being as involved in the business, in every aspect of the business, as you are now this far down the line. So we need to, for our own sanity and for our own progress through Maslow's, we need to start building systems and structure and get out of the mindset of just doing everything all the time. Okay, so what's some simple systems and structure that you can implement? And at the top level, I'd say this is probably the most powerful one for creating sanity and structure. Stick your business scorecard up on a whiteboard or use a spreadsheet, whatever you might need to do, and start tracking your top 10 metrics weekly. We tend to overcomplicate what our businesses do um, and make it very difficult for us to understand what's going on and, and make it way too complex. So by breaking that down into 10 top numbers, uh, maximum of 15, then we start to really understand how the business is performing on a week by week basis and what we need to do to improve that. Very famous saying, what gets measured gets improved. You don't have to do all of this yourself. You can ask your team to track it, you know, get the team together, make a workshop out of this. You know, we need to build our company scorecard. What's the top 10 metrics? If you want a little bit more guidance on this, highly recommend reading the book Traction by Gino Wickman. So get your scorecard done. And then your second challenge, this is for you and the team, uh, is to use these two free tools, Trello and Loom. So they're both free and they've got loads of functionality for free. So Trello enables you to build lists and charts within uh, like a post-it notes and uh, within different boards and Loom enables you to do screen recordings. So what we want you to do is get your team to define their job roles and their KPIs and so the, key, the key kind of things that they're measured on and then to document the 20% of the processes they do that produce 80% of the results. So get everybody within your team to build a Trello board for free, like you can see up here, this, this one on the screen is an employee manual. And then across the top there, they're gonna stick down their kind of, their core role. So if it's admin, it could be onboarding a new member of staff, it could be filling out how, how we complete this report. If it's the person on the ground or the service, it could be how we uh, deliver this service in this way, how we deal with these customers and get them to document that by creating Loom videos and lists and to-dos. Now that might sound like a bit of a job, but it's gonna create a whole level of structure within your business that wasn't there before. If we just have all the knowledge of our business within everybody's heads, 
we feel constantly stressed. If we lose a member of staff, it's a huge stress because we, we, we it's difficult to recruit, recreate the work they were doing. Uh, if we bring somebody new in, it takes ages to train them up. If somebody's sick, it's very difficult to get the work done that they were doing. So the business is like hijacked by people's mindsets and what's stuck within people's minds. So we need to make sure that we start to document that knowledge that's within people's heads and those processes. And this starts to build a blueprint for our business and how it can kind of function uh, almost on autopilot so this is a great challenge for you and your team to do for them it's good because often staff and small businesses are stressing when they go on holiday because they know the work's not going to get done when they're away if it's documented and processed it can get done so the two things within there are your company scorecard and documenting your 20 percent of your core processes so next one then very important coach more manage less Historically, we humans um, had very little choice in the work that we did. If you think back to like industrial revolution, we, we, the jobs that were available were the jobs that were available. We didn't have any choice and we had to work to survive. Okay, so actually all a lot of companies needed to do was pay us um, and maybe make, make us feel like we belong. But they didn't need to do anything else and people would stay in the job because they had no choice. Two big, thing, two big things have changed in more recent times. Number one, we have a huge amount of choice in the work that we can do, uh, more so than ever before in human history. And secondly, we don't actually have to work. We could not work and just figure stuff out and we still survive. You know, people get support from their families, benefit systems, whatever it might be. So due to this, you can no longer create high levels of employee retention by just giving people a job and paying them and telling them they're part of the team. It just doesn't work anymore. If we do that, if that's all we do, they're going to leave. So we have to now, it's our responsibility to, in order to grow the business through people, to guide them through these processes. So we have to not just pay them and make them feel like they belong, but we have to show them they're good at what they do. We have to make them feel like they are developing a level of self-confidence and um, independence. And then we have to connect them to the bigger picture of the business. If we can do this, we'll create highly high performing people that are highly loyal to the business if we can't if we don't do this they're going to become dissatisfied disengaged and they're going to lose loyalty and leave sir john whitmore author of coaching for performance a great book which i'd highly recommend you reading is quoted as saying a leader's task is simple to get the job done and develop employees the challenge for small business owners is they're really good at getting the job done and that's got them to where they are they haven't yet figured out the developing employee piece or shifted their mindset to realize how important that is to success. So your challenge for this part, which is again, free to implement, is to book in coaching sessions with all of your staff. So these should be 60 to 90 minutes and you should do these quarterly. So you wanna get into the mindset and uh, flow of doing that. Um, but what you can do if you're not sure where to even start that coaching conversation is pinch our personal development process, which is essentially a, a cue card for coaching um, again, off better happy from those free tools. So you can go and download that. It's a three part session. Uh, the first part gets the employee to tell us about how they're feeling. So you get them to fill that out. You get the instructions for this when you download it. The second part is where we, we review performance and see what can we do to help you get better if you need any help. And then finally, it's setting some, some goals. Okay, again, a bit of a mindset piece around here. Why do business owners struggle, small business owners especially, but businesses in general, struggle to get into this coaching um, approach to business? So the first thing is don't be a perfectionist, okay? A lot of business owners feel that everything has to be perfect, otherwise their customers are gonna um, leave them and they'd be outraged, okay? But it's just, it's not true. And if we are perfectionists, we'll find it very difficult to start coaching our employees and giving them responsibility so let go of perfectionism in order to grow and in order to empower your employees stop trying to think that employees have got to be as good as you okay you're probably the best at what you do and you're never going to make people that are 100 percent as good as you you've got you've had a unique life you've learned lots of different things that have molded you into the person that you are um so when you're thinking about upskilling your employees, just think about making them 80% as good as you. They don't have to be 100% as good as you. It's just not realistic. You have to embrace mistakes and you have to let your employees make mistakes, okay? If we, that's how we become successful, by making mistakes and learning, that's how our employees become empowered. So they might go and do something not as well as you could do it 
and make a mistake, but you've got to let that happen. You've got to embrace that. It's for the greater good and it's what will help them be as good as they can be and your business be as good as it can be. So you've got to embrace those mistakes. And finally, 10 people, 10 good people can build a house better than one excellent person. So what does this mean in your business? It's pretty obvious. 10 people that are half as good as what you can do will run your business better than you can on your own. So you've got to get into this mindset of increasing capacity and empowering your employees. Better for them, better for you, better for the business, better for your clients, better for the world. Get out of the mindset that you're the best at it and it's just easier if you do it yourself. That's not a good way of thinking. You're going to limit the scale of your business. You're going to stay stuck. You're going to make your employees unhappy. So really try and embrace those four mindset things. If you don't embrace those, you will stay stuck feeling frustrated and your team will become will, will become or remain unhappy. Okay, number four, talk about well-being. Now, if we look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, we've talked about how performance is at the top end here, yeah? So esteem, when somebody's stacked on all those bottom pieces, they've got esteem from others, they've got esteem for themselves, and they start to become self-actualized. Now, well-being is just your health comes within the safety component, which is right down here at the bottom of the bottom of the hierarchy. So, essentially, what that shows us is that if somebody's health is suffering, they're not going to perform high because that becomes the priority, it becomes a distraction, it takes over all other components. So, we have to make sure that people have got as much support as possible to be healthy. Now, historically. The, the risks to our health were war, famine, not having medication, lots of different things that us clever humans have managed to, for those of us fortunate enough to be living in more wealthy societies, um, get got rid of most of those challenges. However, what we interestingly, what we see is that instead of preventable mortality rates going down completely, we just see the mortalities being replaced and the stresses and the uh, sicknesses being replaced with different things. So over here on the left, you can call these diseases of poverty. Over here on the right, you can call these diseases of affluence. So my point is, even though we've got more money and more comfort now, we're actually still just as sick, but from different things. So your employees will struggle with, I can guarantee it, some of them uh, will struggle with obesity or poor energy levels due to processed foods. Uh, you'll have cases of uh, musculoskeletal conditions, so poor pain, uh, pain from poor posture, uh, knee pain, neck pain, back pain, whatever it might be and stress. So these are all modern challenges and they're created by the modern environment. So it's not your responsibility as a business owner to fix everybody's well-being and that's that's obviously a, a nice thing to think about. It's not your responsibility. However, of course it has a huge impact on you and your business and your people well-being and that's either going to be positive or negative. Okay? If it's um bad then it's going to affect our retention levels. It's going to affect productivity levels of the team and the, therefore the business. Absenteeism, people are going to be off sick if they're struggling with well-being. And presenteeism, people might be scared to go off sick but still come into work and not able to do their, their job well. Your business and businesses in general are one of the most powerful agents for change. You know, people spend 50% of their waking hours on a working day at work. So yes, it's not our responsibility, but it, we've got so much to gain from addressing this. And we are probably some of the most significant people or the businesses, the most significant factors to actually address well-being as a positive and reap the rewards of doing it. So how do we do it? So what do most businesses do? They spend lots of money on incentives, believing that they're going to address the problem. So gym memberships, health insurance, um, reward schemes, uh, gifts for our staff. Now, these are good. I'm not saying these things are bad, but they don't solve the well-being problem. They don't address the problem. They're just incentives. Don't mistake an incentive as a solution. Okay, the wonderful thing about the actual solution, which is actually talking about some of these key areas, is that doesn't cost any money. So what we recommend at Better Happy is to allot 60 minutes a month, that's, that's one hour a month or a morning a month, to talk about one of the four components that are raised here. And that is movement slash posture, nutrition, sleep, and mental health or stress management, same kind of thing. So if you talk about one of those um, each month for an hour, then over the year, you've addressed those four very important topics three times with your staff. Uh, which is something that's probably not been done for them anywhere else in their lives. So extremely powerful thing to do. Now, you might be looking at that going, Mike, I haven't got a clue about these areas. I'm, you know, I'm a business owner. Why, what do I know about nutrition? 
few pointers here. You don't need to be an expert on any of these subjects to have a conversation about these subjects. Just allotting some some safe time within working hours to have a conversation about these areas makes you do makes you ahead of most companies when, when it comes to effect, um, addressing well-being effectively. Have the conversation, and if you don't even know where to start, get everyone together, have a cup of tea, ask everybody what are you struggling with in this area? Movement, nutrition, sleep, mind. Get everybody to just get that out in the room. And then what can we do to help? Is there anything we can do to help at work? That will mean the world to people and have a huge impact on well-being. What we also recommend highly is to run 30-day challenges around these. Okay, and you can make that 15 days, whatever it might be. But talk about movement with your staff, have a conversation, see what people are struggling with. You're gonna get a list of stuff that you could then either yourself or get somebody else in the business to go away and research. Uh, and then create a 30 day challenge. So movement, okay, right, for the next 30 days in work, we're gonna put a challenge on around who can hit five to 10,000 steps a day and then get a WhatsApp group or a board up if you're in an office and just cre- just start to normalize a culture where we promote well-being. Uh, so that's really powerful and relatively easy to do. If you want to go more detailed with it, say you, know, you realize everyone's stuff from their bad backs, there's tons of free resources available on the internet. And obviously, we've got some over at Better Happy, which you can download again from that toolkit stage. Um, And this is like a workplace mobility routine. So you could get somebody up, have a bit of a laugh, talk through this process, get some get some polls out. Of course, this is a service we offer, but you can do this for free. You do not need to spend money to uh, address these areas. So just to summarize, talk about one of those components once a month for an hour. And then if you've got the the capacity, run run a 15 or 30 day challenge. You are doing a huge service by doing that um, and you don't need to spend any money. So one, two, three, four. Finally, number five, reducing owner dependency. Now, doesn't this sound exciting? So we need to work less to grow more, which sounds great, but we struggle to do so. And it's really important to understand this common saying of what got you here won't get you there. So you have got to where you are by grafting, being involved in every aspect of the business and just doing, doing, doing. That will not get you to this satisfaction stage. It won't get you to an empowered team. It won't get you to work-life balance. It won't get your business to scale. I'm not saying that you're not going to have to work hard and anybody that says that is doesn't truly understand business, but you are going to have to change your approach. And this is where the challenge lies because we're just used to doing it in a certain way. Now, if you think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs from your own perspective, because in theory you are an employee within the business at the moment, you're probably quite up on the high up on the chart. You've probably had lots of positive feedback from clients and other people. Your self confidence is probably quite high. Uh, yet, the piece you need to really get to is this self actualization, and this is achieving your your meaning in life. You're finding your vision, um, living by your values, and. For you, probably, this doesn't involve you, if we're honest, being involved in the business, stressed out and and struggling with your team. This probably involves you realizing your vision and guiding the business to to where it needs to be. So it's really important for you, if you're honest with your own vision, that you remove yourself from being stuck in the business and being involved in every aspect. And for the team as well, obviously, for them to progress, they need to feel that you trust them to to do things within the business without your presence. So this all comes down to developing employees again so that you don't need to be there. So we need to trust our employees to start running our business more for us incrementally. Okay, it's not just right, I'm going, get on with it. Obviously that wouldn't work. But we need to be in a mindset where that's actually going to happen. Now you will be used to, and I'm I'm gonna labor this point, being in the business all the time, not taking holiday, you know, sacrificing yourself for for the success of the business which has done you probably well to get to where you are, but it's not going to get you to that next stage. So you need to get into the mindset that this business needs to function without you. And the only way that we can force that to happen is actually start to force this mindset shift. So as an owner, what you need to do, uh, and again, again, remember this is free, you need to book a six week holiday in advance. So I'm not saying the holiday is going to be free, but you can book that time off. Um, So you need to book those six weeks throughout the year and you need to do that in advance and you need to make it so it's non-negotiable and communicate that with your family and with your team so that you're in the mindset that you are going to be away for at least six weeks of the next 12 months. That's actually quite a conservative amount of holiday. We Really, you should be working towards more, but we need to get you into the mindset first. After that, after you put that in, you're also going to plan that within the next four months, you will be working a four-day week. 
okay? I'm not saying that you have to achieve that. Obviously, it'd be good if you do, but you need to plan that in and again, communicate that to your staff. Now, if you struggle with that, let's imagine it's because you're going to develop a medical condition, which means you can't physically work more than four days. So it has to happen and that is a possibility. Communicate that to the staff as well. What this will do is it will start to get you in the mindset of making the business work without you, which forces you to empower your team and to em embrace some of the mindset things that we've talked about already. Back to mindset then, because owner, I know what you're like, because I'm like it as well. You'll look at these, and be like, oh, that's such a good idea, and then you won't do it, okay? So, what, <laughs> so we're gonna return to mindset, and we're gonna look at, just because you're used to firefighting doesn't mean it's right, okay? Just because you're used to going into the business, getting your gloves on and, and, and facing all the challenges of the week and fixing everything and, and being involved in everything, just because you're used to doing that doesn't mean that, that doesn't mean it's right and what the business needs, it's not. You doing everything, even though you're used to it and it feels heroic, is bad for you and it's bad for your team and if you're in a relationship, it's probably bad for your relationship as well. This is so important, you you are, if you are still very busy in the business and struggling to let the team get on with work for you, you're probably comfortably uncomfortable. You don't like being as involved as you are, you don't like working as much as you do, you don't like the fact that the team isn't as optimal as it can be, but it's a little bit more uncomfortable to actually make the changes that you need to make to make that change. So we need to accept that we are uncomfortable, but we're comfortably uncomfortable. And finally, if you don't set those dates in stone, you won't do it. You'll go away and you'll be like, oh, I know I should do that, but I'll do it next year. And a year will turn into two years, three years, and you'll get burnt out. So you need to set those dates and those times in stone. You need to communicate with your family and your colleagues, your, your team, that you are going to be working less and that you're going to have some holidays stress-free. There's our top five points. So all of these can be done for free. Um, you might be like, okay, that's a lot to take in. Uh, so let's just a few more mindset points to, to go over. Rome wasn't built in a day. That's not Rome, obviously. <laughs> uh, but Rome wasn't built in a day. So don't think that you need, if you're anything like me, don't be tempted to go away and try and make all of these things happen right away. Just start with number one, then number two, then number three, then number four, then number five, and just work through it steadily. Get your team involved, talk to them about what you're doing, but don't feel stressed to try and implement it all at once and just enjoy the process. Just enjoy the process of change, accepting change and, and, and embracing it back onto that change piece business really is just personal development in disguise us business owners we need to get good at accepting that most of the problems that we have within our businesses are due to us a lot of the time so i know we've had things like covid and global pandemics which we can't control but a lot of the time the issues we face with our staff and our customers and other businesses that we compare ourselves to feeling like they're doing better than us that's all because of us so we need to embrace these things and work on ourselves and change these mindsets. If you're not sure where to start, what you can do is head over to bathappy.co.uk and you can click on this orange button and get your own scorecard. And what this will do is give you a score, as you can see down here, in the different components. And what I'll do now is just show you how those components link to everything we've just talked about. This is the Better Happy five skills. Now, when you get good at improving the business across these five skills, you have a more empowered team and a, and a better lifestyle for the owner and a business that can scale more sustainably through people. Strategy is what we talked about at the beginning there. That's your vision and your mission. Your systems, which we talked about were your systems. Support is the coaching piece. Sharpen is the wellbeing piece. And SOAR is reducing owner dependency so you can actually enjoy your life. So you can have a look at your score, see which one you're weakest on, and then go and address that first if you don't want to go through it numerically. Head over to Better Happy, connect with us. Head over to betterhappy.co.uk, fill out one of those scorecards so you know where you're at. And then if you want to get on the phone and chat with us, please do. We'd love to chat with you and get to know more about you and your business. Um, you can book a call with us. You'll get an email telling you how to do that. If you'd like to connect with me or the business, please do. We'd love to connect with business owners and like-minded people um, and anyone that's interested in making businesses better. So that can be employees as well. I hope that you've found today useful and inspiring i really hope that you take some action from what's been in there today so that you can start um, making the business more enjoyable for you and your team and like i said if you have any questions whatsoever please don't hesitate to uh, get in contact or head over to betterhappy.co.uk and get in touch with us